Father God in heaven, your son sits at your right hand. And, and I hope, my hope, my hope and prayer is that as, as the two of you listen to our praise this morning, you are pleased. And that's why we, we live, that's why we breathe, that's why we gather together. It's about you. May it never be about us. Always about you, Lord Jesus. And so we pray that as we open now your word, that you bless it to us, open our hearts, that we might, we might get it, we might understand it. And if there's one here today that really does not know Jesus Christ as his or her Savior, may, may you work in that heart um, right now and draw them to yourself. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Have a seat. Well, good morning again. Thank you. I'm glad that you're here and, and uh, to worship with us. Some of you from out of town, some of you are locals, and maybe you've never been here before, uh, but thank you for coming and uh, joining in with us today. And, and uh, I'm excited about today what we're going to hear from the Word um, and excited also what follows it next Sunday. So a great, great passage of Scripture where... Um, unrolling this morning and next Sunday from 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'd encourage you to open a Bible if you brought one with you. Maybe on your device you have the Bible on there. Take one of the Bibles out of the backs of the chairs or underneath the blue chairs and grab a Bible and uh, find 2 Timothy if you're using the Bibles that we provide. It's on page 1095. And if you're, uh, if you're somebody here today and you say, Rick, I would love to follow you in my Bible, but I don't own one. Um, we want to give you one. And if you'll stop by our our welcome center right outside the door when you leave this morning. Um, I think Tom's going to be there, and he'll be glad to put a Bible in your hand and, and uh, as, as our gift to you this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 2 is where we are. I remember growing up um, as a boy in uh, Midway Park, North Carolina, which is part of Camp Lejeune. My dad, my dad was a Marine. My dad, if you ask him now, he's 83. He's still a Marine every bit. And uh, and I remember having to line up at the community center one day, probably in the late fall, uh, because there was a there was a prediction of a of a flu that was coming through the country, sweeping through the country, and they wanted everybody to be inoculated. And uh, so they said, "We're going to be at this place, the community center. We're going to have nurses there, and they're going to give you uh, the flu shot." And I remember something as I grew up, grew up when I was in college, I remember something very similar back in 70, maybe 76, the, something called the swine flu. Do you remember that? And we all got shots for that. But I remember when I heard that we had to go and get a shot, I was petrified because I had a, an incredible fear of needles, did not like shots whatsoever. It scared me thinking we might, I, I would have to get a shot. In fact, there was one time my mom loves to tell the story about when I, we went to the doctor and I don't remember what for, but it was time for me to get some kind of a shot. You know, you, when you're kids, it seems like you get shots every other week and some kind of shot. And, and I just remember the fear that came over me every time a nurse would take and put that cold alcohol, rub it on my arm or other places on my body. Um, and, and I remember just be, and I, this one particular time, I just decided when I went there and she opened that, got that cotton swab out and put it in that alcohol, and I could smell that. The, to me, that smell of that rubbing alcohol was just like the worst thing in the world. And I shot out of the office. I took off running. And they had to send people to find me and bring me back, and I got the shot anyway. Well, this shot, however, I was told, this shot is going to be different they inoculated you for this particular shot with what looked like a semi-automatic handgun that, <laughs> that had, a, had a little glass vial on top. How many of you ever got a shot by one of those? If you've ever been in the Army or the military, probably you have. And they make it, it makes multiple mass inoculations much easier because there's no needle. They, you, know, they just, you walk up and they put that thing up to your arm and it's, it's got a, a hose connected. You can't see it, but it's connected up to, like, I guess, an air compressor. And uh, true, and I'm not telling you a joke. And, uh, and, and it's a pneumatic thing, and, and, and they squeeze the trigger, and that air shoots that vaccine into your arm. No needle. And just puts it right into your bloodstream, just like that. And some of you have, been, have had those before. Well, that's what they hit me with there back in 1960 or so. 
And, uh, and, I remember, and I remember being told, you know, they're going to, you, you get in line and they've got this gun and being told probably by my mom, don't you worry, Ricky, this isn't going to hurt. And so I would, so, and I thought it was pretty cool that the, it wasn't a needle. And so I went up there, got my shot. I don't remember if it hurt or not. I really don't remember. I don't think it did. But I remember getting that shot. But have you ever been told that something will hurt you now, but the pain is going to go away? You ever been told that by somebody? How about this stuff? This is what my mom used to put on us when I was a kid. (laughs) How many of you know what that's about? Methylate or mercurochrome? And man, we would, you know, we're out playing and we would fall down and scrape our knee or scrape our elbow, you know, and we knew you know, it, you had a choice. You fall down and you scrape and you look and see blood and you either scream out and cry out or you think if you're wise, don't make a sound because mom's going to look outside and wonder what's going on. And if she knows I've been scratched or scraped or cut, she's going to say, come on in the house and she's going to take me into the bathroom and sit me on the toilet and, and get out a washcloth and say, well, before we can do anything, we got to clean it up. And so she would pull out her bar of dial soap with that washcloth and put that on that scrape and, and as hard as she could, you know, to, that hurt bad enough, but that wasn't as bad as what was next. And then she would turn and open the medicine cabinet and out would come this bottle. I would rather have died. Just go ahead and let it be infected. You know, let them cut my leg off. Yeah, it's, it's got iodine. I don't know what all is in that. I know what's in it. Pain is in it. And she would take that out and it had an applicator attached to the cap, the cap and she'd pull out that red stuff and, and rub that all over your cut. And I mean, it just burned. Hurt so bad. But it's going to hurt now, but it'll feel better later, you know, is the, the soothing talk I got. I remember, too, when I was a kid back in the, in the 60s, um, that watch, I watched cartoons on Saturday morning, and, um, and, and they had commercials, and, and you know, I would watch. The, of course, the commercials are all geared toward children. One of the things that got advertised, you know, they had things like Nestle's Quick got advertised every week. You know, you watch Roy Rogers, and they're selling you Nestle's Quick. And, um, but I remember one of the things that got advertised on Saturday mornings was this stuff called Bactine. You remember Bactine? And the selling point on Bactine was that no, it was no pain. It didn't hurt. Whatever was in it, it was some kind of antiseptic, but it had no pain. I don't understand if there's no alcohol or iodine in it, which those are both painful. But, and I would plead with my mother, Mom, please go buy Bactine because I knew I'm going to continue to fall down and scrape and cut and all that. She never bought it, I don't think. Some moms have no compassion. And... um. <laughs> And so, but, but you've been told uh, about different things, you know, it's, it's going to hurt now, but the pain will eventually go away. It's going to heal. The pain is gone. So don't let the fears overwhelm you. Well, let me say to you, that's exactly what Paul is going to tell Timothy in this, the rest of this passage and the rest of this chapter. It's going to hurt now, but, but the, there will come a day when the pain is gone. Right? He told his younger protege, Timothy, to be strong. We read verse 1 a couple Sundays ago. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. So what does that mean? There's a reason that, Timothy, that you need to be strong. So if you're taking notes, your first point is God's grace gives strength for what? To endure persecution. That's where we're going today. To endure persecution. And I think it's sad and, and this pretty much is my context and is yours as well. Although I've been to some other countries and, and ministered and preached and spent some time with missionaries and so forth, but I think it's sad that in American Christianity, especially in some evangelical circles, a false doctrine is proclaimed that says, God, if you're a Christian, here's the great thing. God will prevent the world from hurting you. If you're a Christian, It's okay. God's not going to let you ever get hurt on this earth. It says God intends this doctrine, for example, we'll say God intends for every Christian to prosper financially. If you're a Christian, God doesn't, he's not going to let you be poor. 
And those false teachers are raking in millions on their books and in contributions because their message, frankly, is a very popular one. It's a message that, as Paul would say to Timothy, tickles people's ears, makes us feel good. Well, this is not a feel-good message that Paul gives to Timothy here. After I think, you know, and it's not because who wants to think that believing by believing in Jesus Christ, I might lose everything I own. That's what was happening with Christians there in the Roman Empire. I might lose everything I own. I might be, because Paul was a couple of times, more than a couple of times, I might be imprisoned for preaching the gospel. Who wants that kind of a life? I would, I, you know, I would rather have a, a God that never lets anything bad happen in my life. And in America, more than any other country in this world, we love our comforts, don't we? We really, truly do. And we expect God to honor those comforts. I've worked hard for all these TVs in my house and all these recliners and all these things. I worked hard so I can have that heat on my seat, in my seat, in my car when I started up on a winter day. By the way, aren't you glad it's not cold today? <laughs> I, I checked a couple of my pastor friends um, of other places in the country, and, and one of them posted this. He's in Iowa. And he said, I think I'll wear socks today. <laughs> Another one in Michigan said, we've looked outside and we just come to the conclusion it's too dangerous to come to church because of the ice and snow. God bless them. And I said, hey, you can watch us. <laughs> so um, we, we like comfort. We don't like to be uncomfortable. We don't like to have those comforts taken away. We, we love our comforts. And, uh, and we, we expect our God to ensure, listen to this. I'm going to blow some of you out of the water right now. Put your seatbelt on. We expect our God to ensure that our government leaders will protect us from being uncomfortable. Don't we? Don't nod at me, but we do. The problem with that is it's a kind of a false teaching and it's, and, and that it's not what we read at all in the New Testament. Paul and Timothy lived during a time of some very cruel governors and emperors who were very much anti-Christian. They saw Christianity as being something that was going to overthrow their government, subversive. So it makes me ask this question as I read these kinds of things, as I read Jesus say to his disciples, take up your cross. Put your hand to the plow. As I read those kinds of things that Jesus said to those who would follow him, it makes me wonder, are we Americans in the 21st century, are we better for some reason than those people back then? Are we better than those people in countries like Ethiopia and Iran and China where you could lose your life for being a Christian. Does God love us more than he loves those people? I think I know the answer to that, and I think you do too. No, he doesn't. Well, Timothy's been around when Paul has endured painful hurts, both physical and emotional. He was there, Acts chapter 16, in Philippi, when Paul and Silas were preaching the gospel and people were coming to accept Christ as Savior, and it upset some people in the town. And so they were taken and beaten with rods, Paul and Silas, and then chained in jail for preaching. He was there in the next stop in Thessalonica, where persecution rose against the Christians, and, and the Christians took Paul and Silas and, and at night sent them away to Berea, another city down in the Greek peninsula. Go there. And so they went to Berea, but guess what happened? They go to Berea, and the persecutors who were in Thessalonica, followed them to Berea. And so the persecution arose there as well. And so finally the Christians took Paul and put him on a, on a ship and said, go to Athens. And so they, he went to Athens and Timothy followed him there later and came. As soon as Paul got to Athens, he said, tell Timothy and Silas to come join me here. So Timothy was there in Philippi and Thessalonica to see 
all that persecution and all that suffering. He understood what Paul said, meant when he said, share in the suffering. You need to be strong, Timothy, in God's grace because suffering is ahead. That's why you need strength. And the easy thing for us to do, the easy thing for Timothy to do, and I'm sure he considered it was quit. And to say to God and to say to his mentor, Paul, I don't think this is what I signed up for. I signed up for comfort. I signed up for walking on golden streets. You know what I mean? Mansions in heaven. So how strong does he need to be? Paul uses three examples in verses 3 through 6. He says you need to be soldier strong. You need to be athlete strong. You need to be farmer strong. Everybody understands those three examples. So let's look at them. Verses 3 through 6. Follow with me while I read. So Timothy, share in suffering. Share in hardships. Share in the tough times. Share in the persecutions as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the concerns of civilian life. He seeks to please the recruiter. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to get a share of the crops. Be strong, Timothy, like a soldier. Be a soldier whose life is different from a civilian's life. Now, how many of you served in the United States military? Raise your hand. You were in the military. You've been through basic training. I never served. Well, people ask me, are you a military veteran? I say, yeah, until I was 17. And when I was 17, my dad got out of the Marine Corps, so I no longer served. So, uh, but I've never been to basic training, but I've heard plenty of stories. I have a lot of friends who are Marines, and I hear lots of stories about it. And I know, you know, for example, the Marines, when they get off the, the buses at Paris Island, they get off the bus, and there on the pavement are painted yellow footprints. And they are told by this guy wearing this Yogi Bear hat, kind of a ranger hat. They were told, stand there, put your feet on those, and don't move. I am now your mother and your father, and everything you will ever need is right here in me. Forget the life that you left. And they make them, the clothes that they wore to get there, they're packed up and sent home. We're going to give you everything you need, give you all of your clothing. It's called government issue. You get everything from us that you will ever need. I had a friend that was uh, in boot camp as a Marine down in Paris Island, and he said one day they made them drink a full canteen of water. I don't know how much water is in a a canteen, probably a quart or more in there. You drank that full canteen of water, and then the drill instructor said, now, we're going to go out and do some things, and you're not allowed the rest of the day to relieve yourself. We're going to fill your bladder up And you're going to have to hang on. You're going to have to hold on. You're not going to be able to go. That would be tough, I think, to obey that order. But that required, and that that would require from some some suffering, wouldn't it? Some hardship. Uh, But they weren't allowed. And uh, th- that Marine was being trained to, trained to obey orders and to do his duty because there might be one of these days when he's out on the battlefield and he can't do anything that he wants to do. Nothing else matters in the mind of a soldier but to obey his orders and to do his duties. That's why they tell these young men that join the military and they want to marry their sweetheart they left back home. And, and Sergeant, I want to want to get married. I want to marry my girlfriend. And, and, and they're probably getting an answer something like this. You know, if the army wants you to have a wife, they'll give you one. You know, that's kind of the attitude about it. It's called government issue, GI. If the army wants you to have it, we'll provide it for you. If we don't give it to you, you don't need it. And it's the idea that those things can be an, as Paul says, an entanglement in civilian life. Even a wife can be an entanglement for a young soldier. Entangle gives the idea of being being caught up in something that keeps you from your purpose. If you've ever gone fishing with me, by the way, if you have a boat, I'll go fishing with you, but just let me know. I'll let you know right up front, there's going to be some entanglement um, while I fish. It happens every single time, you know, and all right, throw that rod away. It's no good. And, uh, but it gets entangled. And when your fishing line gets entangled, you can't what? can't catch any fish. It takes a while 
to get out of an entanglement. And a soldier doesn't need to be entangled in things that don't pertain to his life. To prevent being entangled in the world, which always wants to pull us away from our duties to our Savior, Paul's saying to Timothy, you need to have a focus on your purpose like a soldier. You know what your duty is. Tis not mine to wonder why, tis but mine to do or die. That's the mind of a soldier. You need to have the mind, the strength of a soldier. The Christian life has to be lived in a world that is hostile to our Savior, to our values, to our, to our beliefs. We should not be surprised when in our society it seems like the values that we hold dear, the values that come from the Word of God, are constantly being attacked. Oh, no. We shouldn't be surprised because that's what the world is all about. And we might require living for Christ. It might require hardships on our part or suffering, as it said here. Why? And Paul gives a reason why. The great reason. Don't miss what he says. Easy part to skip over. To please our recruiter. That's why. To please our recruiter, the one who brought us into the army, and that would be who? The Lord Jesus Christ. Remember singing the little song when I was a little boy, I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery, I may never zoom or the enemy, because I'm in the Lord's army. That's what Paul's saying. You're in the army, you're going to be expected to live a certain way. Our purpose is to glorify the Lord, and that may be very well may require hardships and the discipline to say, no, I don't participate in that. I can't go there. 2 Corinthians 5, 9, and 10, Paul wrote, so whether we are here in this body, and we're all there right now, everybody in this room, we're here in this body, whether we're here in this body or away from this body. To be away from this body means to be the body is physically dead, but we're still alive. Because Christian, the Bible says, Paul wrote, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So wherever we are for all of our our eternity, our goal is to do what? Please him. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged, and we will receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we've done in this earthly body. How I live my life matters. Then secondly, he wants to use the example of an athlete. He says, be a winning athlete who plays by the rules. And we can offer some contemporary examples about athletes that didn't play by the rules. If you listen to your news at all this week, and I listen to sports talk radio when I'm riding around in my truck, the Houston Astros got caught cheating. They, they had somebody on the other side of the center field wall who had a camera and was stealing the catcher's signs to the pitcher. And the guy over there with the camera would send a signal somehow to the dugout that this is going to be an off-speed pitch, not a fastball, an off-speed pitch. And somebody in the dugout would get that message to the batter by hitting a trash can. Bam! And the batter knew, off-speed pitch, curveball, changeup coming. I'm not going to swing at it. And they were doing that. And they got busted. As a result, boy, the... The manager for the New York Mets, who used to play for the Astros, he got fired. The manager for the Houston Astros, who's taken them to the World Series several times in the last few years, he got suspended by Major League Baseball, but the Houston Astros owner said that's not enough, and he fired him, and he fired the general manager who's the boss of these guys. You're out. You're gone. You cheated. You play by the rules if you're a strong athlete. You do what the rules say. A base runner, I love baseball. And, and, you know, if you're on first base and you're a runner and, and the guy who comes up after you hits a fly ball, let's just say, I mean, he really tags it. And you look at it and you say, if it doesn't go over the fence, it's going all the way to the fence, and I know I can score if I take off and go. So the coach is telling you, go, go, go. Most good coaches will say, go halfway. But you take off running because you know there's no way anybody can catch that, but you forget the guy out in center field has got a gold glove. And he can fly. And he runs, and you get around second base, and all of a sudden you're looking at your third base coach, and he's telling you to get back, get back, get back, get back, which means I've got to go all the way back to where? First base, where I started. But here's the deal. 
It might be quicker for you to go from where you are caught between second and third to cut across the pitcher's mound and get to first base. That would be the quick way to get back. Shortest distance between two points is a straight line. But you can't do the straight line. The rules in baseball say, no, no, no. You've got to, you came and you tagged second base on your way to third. Now you've got to go back by tagging second base and go back to first and try to beat the throw from that outfielder. That's the rule. If you don't tag second base on your way back, umpire says you're out. I became a Christian, and if you're a Christian, you did as well, by faith. By establishing a relationship with the Savior, Jesus Christ. I do not, you do not, did not, we cannot become Christians by keeping rules. That's called legalism. It's not grace. But once, here's the deal, please hear me. Once I have professed Jesus Christ as my Savior, he doesn't say, that's great now. You're born again. You're a Christian. You're free to go out and live however you want. It's not like that. It's not like Christianity is outback steakhouse religion. No rules, just right. That's not how it works. As Christians, we do have rules to live by, don't we? We have rules. We have things that Jesus said called commandments. Love one another. That's one of Jesus' rules. Go into the world and make disciples. That's one of Jesus' rules. We're supposed to do, do those make us Christians? No. But they demonstrate that we're following Christ. And as a Christian, if I'm not following his rules, I'm not walking by faith in the light. And one of the ways I can walk in darkness, we sang about that a moment ago, one of the ways I can do that is I know we have these rules, I know Jesus has these commandments that he said and, and different things in the New Testament that I'm supposed to do as a Christian to demonstrate the world that I'm a Christian, but what I can do is I can ignore those things and I can, if you will, close my eyes to them. I want everybody right now, everybody do this for me, close your eyes. Everybody's eyes closed, don't peek. Raise your hand if right now what you see is darkness. Raise your hand, lift your hand up. Some of you get it. Some of you are not sure, okay? <laughs> sure, it's dark because you've closed your eyes. There's no light coming through to your eyes. Okay, you can open your eyes now. Darkness. And when I walk in darkness, what happens? You get up in the middle of the night, it's dark. And somebody's put something on the floor between your bed and let's just say the bathroom that you didn't know was there. What happens when you walk in darkness? You stumble, you trip, you stub your toe. Or, you know, if it was dark in here and I'm up here teaching and I can't see the edge of this platform, what happens? I fall and I get hurt. That's what happens when we walk in darkness. When we say, God, I know there's some commands, but I'm closing my eyes to them. I'm not listening. I'm not going to obey them. Athletes are disciplined, aren't they? They're disciplined. They know the rules and they live by them. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 to 27, look what he says. And he uses the analogy of being an athlete. He says, don't you know that the runners in a stadium all race, but only one receives the prize. Only one wins the race. Let me interject and say there was no idea of participation trophies. All right, those you you get a trophy if you win. Now everyone who competes exercises self control in every in your diet, in your rest, in in just in your training. You exercise self control. However, they runners do it to receive a crown that will fade away, a trophy that's going to disappear, it's going to die. They would get those those um, little crowns made out of olive leaves. Well, they don't last forever. But, he says, we, Christians, we're running a race. We're going to get a crown that will never fade away. Therefore, he says, as a Christian, in this journey I'm with Christ, this race I'm running as a Christian until I die, don't run like one who runs aimlessly. He's going everywhere. Well, a runner, a runner who, what you, we see these people running the marathon every November. We don't ever see anybody running the marathon headed north. Do we, Chad? They're not headed north. They're all headed south until they get down to, to a whalebone junction and then they head east. Why are they heading south and then east? Somebody tells me, tell me, what's ahead? The 
finish line. They're not running aimlessly. They've got an aim for the finish line. He said, I don't box like somebody beating the air. Instead, I discipline my body and bring it under strict control so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified for cheating. Athletes, like a farmer next, work hard for what's ahead. What happens if a farmer's lazy? What happens if he doesn't get out and plow the fields? What happens if he decides, you know, today I really should plant seed, but I think I'm going to go surfing. What happens if, if he says, you know, it's just kind of, uh, I got better things to do, and he lets, his, lets the sun, the, the corn get burned by the sun instead of harvesting it? What happens to his income? He doesn't have any. He has no source of food for himself. And one of the things that, that we know about farmers, and maybe you've got some experience farming, is that one thing I know about successful farmers, they work hard. They, and even unsuccessful farmers sometimes work really, really hard. Hard. And as Paul develops these examples of a soldier and an athlete, a farmer, it becomes clear that this is all in the context of being rewarded in Christ's kingdom. Which for Paul is a major theme for so much of his writing, and that's because Paul knows Jesus Christ is coming back and he's going to set up his kingdom on earth, and he, he knows that all who claim him as Savior will stand before him to be judged for staying out of the entanglements of the world, for playing by the rules, for working hard in the harvest field for Christ. So just like we, we, we don't become Christians by keeping the rules, we don't become Christians by working hard. We will be judged and we will be rewarded, rewarded by Christ for those things in his kingdom. Well, then after using these three illustrations, the soldier, athlete, farmer, Paul says, Timothy, here's what you need to do next. He said, I want you to stop and think about it. Verse 7, consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. We, we call, well, let me give you this point. There's a, here's a Bible lesson, simple lesson for us in understanding the Bible. We call interpreting the Bible, the word for that, uh, the theological term is hermeneutics. And there are two ingredients that are necessary to get what the Bible says, to understand what the Bible says. What has to happen in your life? A couple things. Number one, you have to meditate on it. Paul says, consider it. Don't just read speed. You can't speed read the Bible and get anything from it. You need to stop and meditate it and go over it again and again, spend time mulling over it. And that takes some effort on our part because that takes time. If you drop down to verse 15, Paul's going to tell Timothy to be diligent, to be a hard worker. And the reason most Christians don't understand the Bible is because they don't spend any time in it. They don't read it. They don't spend time considering it. And that takes effort on our part. Here's, here's, here's the dirty little secret about Christians. Can I share you with you the dirty little secret about Christians? I really don't have time. I don't want to put forth the effort to study and consider the Word of God on my own because here's the great thing. I can go to church on Sunday and Rick can explain it all to me. That's not how it's supposed to work. Right? Because what if Rick gets up and he says something that's wrong? If you haven't studied the scripture, for, I'm going to do that one Sunday. I'm going to get up and I'm going to say something that's really, really wrong. And I want to see how many people say, whoa, whoa, whoa. You messed that up, bud. That's not right. Can I do that sometime? You're shaking your head no. I will. All right? <laughs> Just because you shook your head, I'm going to do it. Um, meditate on it. It ta that takes effort on your part and on mine. Then the second thing you need to do to understand the Word of God is you've got to trust God to give you understanding. Paul says that's God's part. The Lord will give you understanding in everything. Apart from God, apart from the Holy Spirit, helping you, you cannot get the Bible. And that's one indication. A person might be very religious, but... The Bible just makes no sense to him or her. I have people every now and then, Rick, I try reading the Bible. It just makes no sense. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, if you want to turn back there with me, I want to read a passage there. It's on page 1051. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. Paul says, Now 
we, and he's, who is the we? He's writing to the church, God's church in Corinth, to those sanctified. I'm looking at verse 1 of chapter 1. Those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called saints. He's talking to Christian people. Makes it very plain. He says, now we, Christians, we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who comes from God, so that we may understand what has been freely given to us by God. We also speak these things, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. Look at verse 14. But the unbeliever does not welcome what comes from God's Spirit. It is foolishness to him. He's not able to understand it since it is evaluated, judged spiritually. And what Paul's saying is he doesn't have the Holy Spirit. The spiritual person, however, can evaluate everything, yet he himself cannot be evaluated by anyone for who has known the Lord's mind? Great question. Who has known the Lord's mind that he may instruct him? And Paul gives the answer. Look what his answer is, the very last phrase of that chapter. He said, but we have the mind of, anybody looking at it with me? Somebody tell me. Christ. We, Christian, he's talking to the Corinthians, we have... Right now, present tense, the mind of Christ. So think about this. A soldier's discipline will protect him, won't it? We hope so. And also protects those he defends. Also may protect his fellow soldiers. He's earning wages being a soldier, but he's also sacrificing for other people. When a soldier fights, the nation benefits. People are set free. People are protected. The athlete who trains hard and keeps the rules gets the gets the crown, gets the trophy. The crowd who watches, what about them? He said, runner, Paul said, in a stadium. What about the people watching? Any benefit for them? Oh, yeah. They're entertained. They're encouraged by what they see. A farmer's hard work does what? It should feed his family, but also feed many other families as well. So what's the point of this passage? It's not about soldiers, and it's not about athletes, and it's not about farmers. This is not a military passage, a military sermon. This is not athletic training. This is not agriculture. It's about Christians like Timothy and those at that time in Ephesus under Roman persecution. It's about you and me in 2020, enduring persecution and suffering and hardship for the sake of Christ. And then Paul gives Timothy and us two motivations for enduring hardship. Look with me at verse 8. Let me get to the right passage. Go back to 2 Timothy. Keep your attention on Jesus Christ as risen from the dead and descended from David. This is according to my gospel. Why endure suffering? Why? And he gives the reasons. Number one, because Jesus did. Because Jesus did. Take a look at Jesus, Paul says, and his emphasis is on Christ's resurrection. And why look at that? Because that proved once and for all, if nothing else happened, that proved that Jesus was and is God. But there would not be, think about this, there would be no resurrection had there not earlier been a crucifixion, would there? Before he could be risen from the dead, he had to be put to death. He had to suffer the cross. There There was no suffering If there was no suffering before the resurrection, there would not have been one. Hebrews 12, 2 says, keeping our eyes on Jesus, not on the other soldiers, not on the other runners in the race, not on the other farmers. Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author, source, and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that lay before him, he went to the cross, but he knew what was on the other side. He endured the cross, despised the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God's throne. You know, my first reaction, and yours perhaps, to persecution as a comfortable American, as somebody who knows our rights as Americans, might be to run from persecution, might be to fight against it, might to cry out for my rights. Jesus saw persecution and suffering as part of the journey that he had to take. It says, for the joy that lay before him, and for that joy, knowing what was on the other side, he endured crucifixion. Why? So he could experience resurrection, so he could experience ascension to his father. He knew that. 
Paul's gospel, the message he preached faithfully is that Jesus died and Jesus rose again. You go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning of verse 3, and read that gospel. And during the hard times of persecution that Paul knows, Timothy, you're going to experience some things. You're going to go through some hard times. I want you to keep your attention on Jesus. And know that if Jesus was not exempted from suffering, you will not be either. And that will be enough to get you through it. And Paul, by the way, mentions that Jesus was, he said he was, not only did he resurrect, he said he was descended from David. In our recent Christmas series that we did, we, we because things that we learn, we understand the importance of that point, descended from David, because both the miracle of the resurrection and the miracle of Jesus being born of a virgin descended from the line of David, heir to David's throne, both of those things point to Christ. Jesus being the Messiah, the promised one. Together, they're a fantastic apologetic in defense of the gospel. Then close out with this, verse 9. Paul said, verse 8, keep your eyes, keep your attention on Jesus. And then verse 9, he said, I suffer for it. I suffer for it to the point of being bound like a criminal. But God's message is not bound. Endure suffering, Christian, Timothy, because Paul did. Because Paul did. The business of getting ready for the pain that is coming, this is going to hurt now, but later on, it's all going to be better. And that's what Paul's telling Timothy. The business of getting ready for the pain that's coming, Timothy, is, is very real. And, and I know you can, that you can do it because I've done it. It isn't just spiritual rah-rah. This is not just a pep talk before the game. It's encouragement. Yes. But it's coming from the heart of one who's experiencing it right now because as Paul has that scroll and that quill and he's writing this letter to Timothy, where is he? He is deep, dark, in a deep, dark, dank, nasty Roman prison. That's where he is. We'll get to that in chapter four as he talks about that. That's where he is. He understands. In fact, he's going to write to Timothy before he closes this book out. He's going to say, I'm I'm, I'm going to die soon. I know it. They're going to cut my head off. I know it. They're going to execute me. His race, Paul said, my, I've run my race. <laughs> I'm hitting the finish line. There's a crown now waiting ahead for me. That's why I endure, because I know what's coming. Not just a pep talk from Paul to a discouraged young friend. It's real. Timothy, I know what I'm talking about. By the way, Timothy never saw Jesus, did he? Timothy wasn't, he was in another place. Never saw Jesus alive. Never saw Jesus crucified like the disciples, the apostles did. But you know who he did see suffer persecution? Paul. Timothy, you can do this because I've done it. And even though the messenger, Paul says, can be chained like a criminal, here's the great thing. The message can't be chained. Hear me, hear me, Christian. God's message, the gospel, cannot be bound. It cannot be bound by governments like the Soviet Union was or like China or Iran is that it cannot be bound by anything that happens on Capitol Hill in the United States of America. Can't. Why? Because it's God's power. Look at Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's God's power for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. That Jesus died and rose again is the truth that brings salvation. And the salvation of lost humanity, we sang it a little while, a little while ago, is why he didn't want heaven without us. So God, you did what? You sent heaven down. You brought heaven down. It's the, it, the salvation of lost humanity is why God sent him. He's not going to let men shut that down. Men will not close the gates to heaven. It's unstoppable. And the only way to silence the gospel Can the gospel be silenced? The only way to silence the gospel is for you and I who have been saved to hide it or be ashamed of it. So would you bow your heads with me as we close? How about you? Are you okay with the idea that your faith in Christ might result in suffering and persecution? Some of you might be experiencing some of that right now in your home, in your marriage, among your classmates at school because of your commitment to Jesus Christ. And let me encourage you today, as Paul encouraged Timothy, hey, Timothy, don't wonder why that's happening. It's part 
and parcel to our calling in Christ. In fact, welcome it because you know you're in good company when you are persecuted, when that day comes. You're standing with Jesus. Next week, we'll continue Paul's explanation of the purpose for suffering and hardship and how it all ties in. How all the pain ties into the the good things that are coming, the kingdom of Christ and the eternal rewards he's going to give to us if we've been disciplined enough to endure. Father, would you please take your word and change our lives with it? We're fortunate here right now in this country, God, that we really haven't to the degree that they are in other places in this world and, 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 and in the past and history and all the horrible persecutions that Christians have gone through, we haven't yet experienced that here. We're thankful for that. We're thankful, God, that you've shed your grace on us. But that day may come to a close, and we as Christians may need to toughen up and be strong like a soldier, like an athlete, like a farmer. I pray that we are doing that right now for that day that may come. We'll be ready that we won't bail on you because you never bailed on us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.